I want to take you on a little bit of a journey, and it starts here. This is in Bolivia. This is called Mount Sahama. It's the highest mountain in the country of Bolivia. Now, how many people here have ever spent a night inside a tent? If you've ever slept in a tent overnight, raise your hand nice and tight. Look around the room. I mean, just about everybody, right? Now, how many people here have ever spent a bad night in a tent? Bad night in a tent? Yeah. It's the same question, in case you've never been in a tent before. Well, I want to tell you not about a bad night, but a terrifying night that I spent when I was here. Like I said, this is Mount Sahama, 21,463 feet above sea level. We'd made uh, a day to get into base camp, another day to get up to high camp, and uh, it was right about there where we were. And we were going to make our, it was from here that we were going to make our final push for the summit. Now, I know what some of you are thinking, you're, oh, you're one of these professional mountain climbers who then does speeches. On the contrary, I just signed up. In fact, I asked John, our lead guide on our expedition, I said, John, what would real climbers call guys like me who just sign up? He says, well, some would call you a tourist. And I was like, you know what, that fits, because tourists are in places they're not supposed to be, right? And I should not be at 18,000 feet. Well, there's not really much to do at high camp except get into your tent and get to sleep. Because at 2 in the morning, you've got to get up, get your gear on, and start your way towards the summit. The only problem is Sahama. It's just legendary for its high winds. And tonight it's living up to its reputation. Because as you get into your tent, I, I want you to imagine that there you are. The Atacama Desert lay a few thousand feet below you. You all know what it's like to get into a tent. But this tent, as you get in, it's sort of like getting onto this table perched on the side of a mountain. It's you don't know if it's going to hold you. And as you lay down, this is what you hear. And the tent is just shaking and moving and rattling. And this is really freaking me out, right? You're already kind of freaked about the day ahead and you're nervous and you're scared. And I remember thinking the same thing you'd be thinking, right? We're going to blow off this mountain tonight. And I'm wondering, what's that going to be like? Rolling down the side of this mountain inside this tent in the dark with another man. I was telling this story and, and one woman in her 60s put up her hand in the audience. She said, oh, count me in. It's like, I don't know. I don't know that's how you want to go. But anyway, so what did I do for some reassurance? I turned to John, my leader, who was sharing the tent with me. And I'm like, hey, psst, uh, John, any chance that we might blow off this mountain tonight? And John, like good leaders, he reassures me and he says, no, he says, these tents are built for this. So feeling only a little bit better, I resumed the fetal position only to see John get up on one elbow, you know, zzz, open the, the, the flap of the tent, stick his head out into the, into the night and turn it on and see, just to see that the other tent was still there, right? And I see him do this and I, I now I'm really freaked. At this point, I even remember reaching underneath my sleeping bag, groping the floor of the mountain until I found a rock underneath the tent and I just grabbed onto it and held on for dear life. Now, I knew this wouldn't keep us from blowing off the mountain, but I just wanted a reference point, you know, were we moving? And it was at that moment I asked myself that question, what am I doing here? And how did I get into this? And maybe you've had those days in HR, right? How did I get into this? <laughs> well, we finally drift off to sleep and it's hard to sleep at high altitude. And we're awakened by the sound of Charlie's voice. Charlie's the cook on the expedition. We hear him outside, 2 a.m. Senor, Senor John, we have a problem. I mean, this is not what you want to wake up to, right, at 18,000. We're like, what is it, Charlie? You know, we're, we're, we're in terrible sleep. You feel like you've got the flu. And he says, the stove, it's not working. It turns out we have all these problems, and it looks like our, 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 we don't have enough water to drink because we didn't melt enough ice from the glacier, and this might jeopardize our trip. But we just figure, you know what, let's just go for it. So five of us, we, we lock in on rope together, and we start heading up 2.30 in the morning up towards the glacier. One of the climbers starts having problems and it looks like he's going to have to go back down. And so they cut the rope and take him down. Leaving now just three of us left to go for the summit. Osvaldo, our lead guide from Bolivia. Jim Sibley, a guy from North Carolina. And me bringing up the rear. And as you're climbing in South America at high altitude, it's very slow. And I took some video after we'd been out for a few hours. You can see us here. That's Jim in front of me, that's Osvaldo in front of him. 
And I'd love to say it's more romantic than that, but it's like this for hours and hours and hours. And you can see how slow you go and how hard you're breathing. Well, after we climb for, I don't know, maybe about, a, we're, it's almost noon. We've been climbing a long time. Jim, he starts to get tired. He's starting to stop all the time. He's starting to, you know, lean over, lean on his ice axe and say things like, this is tough. He'd go a little bit further and he'd stop again. I don't know if I can do this. And what's happening is the mountain is beginning to wear Jim down. And he's starting to doubt whether he can do this or not, except we have a problem. Because if Jim quits climbing now, it's over for everybody. We're down to our last piece of rope, our last guide, and if he quits, we all go back down. So what Jim needs now is motivation. In fact, what he could really use is a motivational speaker climbing right behind him. But all he has is me, right? So, but no, hey, motivation's my thing, and so I get to work. Come on, Jim, we can do this one step at a time. That's how you climb a mountain. We're almost at the top. Hours and hours from now. And I keep urging him on, and this goes on for maybe about an hour. And all of a sudden, it's like somebody pulled my plug. You know that happens to you sometimes, 3.30 in the afternoon? Someone pulls your plug, and I had no energy. And then I'm the one leaning over going, this is tough. And now I'm stuck because I don't know if I can do this soon turns into, I don't know if I want to do this. But now I'm, I'm the one in trouble, right? Because if I quit, it's over for everybody. And I'm thinking, how do you go home and turn that into a speech, right? And so I remember being in this very bad place thinking, how do I get off this mountain without quitting? And it's like, it hit me like a lightning bolt. And I realized, that's it. I don't need to quit to get down. I just need Jim to quit. Because if Jim quits, it's like an honorable discharge from the mountain, right? I can still go home and I can say, well, I would have made it to top if it wasn't for this guy. And so now what happens with the, with the encouragement and the motivation from me? It starts to dry up, right? And when Jim says, wow, it's tough, what do I say? Sure is. Oh, you've been there. Well, the problem with knowing how to motivate, you also know how to demotivate. And I know what's keeping him going. It's, it's me. He doesn't want to let me down. So... I'm like about to kick those legs out from under him and I'm like, hey Jim. He's like, yeah, we're climbing. I'm like, listen, I'm not obsessed with the summit. If you, need, if you need to go down, that's okay with me. He's like, no, must keep going. No, really Jim, safety first. Anyways, this, this madness goes on for another maybe hour and finally Osvaldo, sensing that Jim is at his limit, decides to call a meeting. It's hard to have a meeting at 20,000 feet because there's no place to sit. And so you kind of dig your crampons in, you dig your ice axe in, and you don't want to drop anything because just, whoosh, it's gone. And as Valdo gets on the radio and he says, base camp, he says, clients are tired. We're just going to decide now whether we're going to continue on or whether we're going to come back down to base camp. He hangs up the phone, and don't ask me why, I pull out my video camera and I just happen to film this moment. You can't hear anything, but you can see Osvaldo in the black balaclava. We are really high. And he is thinking long and hard about what to do next. I think Jim was wondering what's it going to take to get Osvaldo to take him down. I think I was wondering what's it going to take to get Jim to quit. And I think Osvaldo was wondering what's it going to take to get these two turkeys from here and to get them up here. Because what had gotten us to 20,000 feet was not going to be enough to get us to 21,460. More would be needed, but it wouldn't come from us. It was going to have to come from leadership. Well, let me ask you a question. What's Osvaldo's job? I mean, what's Osvaldo paid to do? You know, I ask this in smaller audiences, people throw out questions, things like, well, he's paid to keep you safe. Well, that's true, he is paid to keep us safe, but that's not really the main, that's not his main job. Osvaldo's main job is to get us to the top of a mountain and get us back down, right? While being safe and having fun along the way. But in a sense, he's paid to produce a result. Get us to the top of a mountain and get us back down. Well, let's rewind this man's life a little bit, maybe a few years, and we will find out that before Osvaldo was a mountain guide, he was a mountain climber. Mountain climbers climb mountains. It's a very technical sport, a lot of technical stuff. And all he had to worry about was the mountain. 
And he was so good at climbing mountains that at some point someone said, hey, why don't you help people climb mountains, right? And he became a mountain guide. But in order to be a successful mountain guide, a monumental shift had to happen inside the, man, inside the, the mind of this man. Because it, now it's no longer about mountains. Now it's about helping people climb mountains. So let me ask you this. What about you? What are you paid to do? Now everybody in here is going to have a slightly different job description, right? You're, you're, you're paid to do something. But I know this. You're paid to produce some kind of a result. You're paid to produce some kind of result, but the, but, you know, the, the question is, well, really, who produces those results? And here's a simple truth before we kind of jump into nine minutes on Monday today, and it's this, that you are paid to produce results, but in reality, it's your people who produce them. The majority of it. I mean, you're part of it, absolutely. But your people produce the majority of the results. And therefore, if your success, your scoreboard, is based on how well they do their job, then you want to focus your energy on helping your people be successful. Here's our problem, though. It's the same problem that the pilots had, Eastern Flight 401, 1976. Heading into Miami International Airport, they are going into land, and like all airplanes do, they flip the switches to put down the wheels. Good thing. And yet one of the lights doesn't come on to, to confirm that one of the wheels is down. That's kind of a problem, right? Something you don't want to take a chance with. Is the, is the wheel down or is it not down, but the, you know, the, li and the light's working or it's not working, who knows? And so Tower tells him to go up at 2,000 feet and figure out the problem. They go up 2,000, they put it on autopilot, and as it's on autopilot, they begin changing the light bulb. Problem is, it gets stuck. And they're trying to pull it out, and they finally get it out, and then they try and get it back in, and it gets jammed. Well, the co-pilot gets working on it, the pilot gets working on it, and they get so focused on this 50 cent light bulb that what they think happened was that the, the, the pilot's knee might have hit the autopilot stick, turning it off. And now, no one is flying the plane. And when no one flies a plane, it tends to do one thing, it descends. And so through the middle of the night, it's descending, there's no visual cues. Meanwhile, there's a whole dashboard of gauges that tell them that they are going down, but no one's paying attention because everyone is absorbed with the 50 cent light bulb. They get to 500 feet. An alarm goes off in the cockpit to tell them you're at 500, just kind of standard. No one picks up on it. 400, 300, 200, 100. Finally, the tower radios and says, hey, Eastern, everything okay up there? Co-pilot's like, yeah, but we're at 2,000, right? And then they're like, hey, what happened to our altitude? And by then it was too late to course correct and they crashed. It's just a sad, tragic story. It's a tra tragic story about what happens when leaders get away from their most important thing. And for a pilot, that's flying a plane. Was the 50 cent light bulb important? Absolutely, it was really important. It was critically important. Was it more important than flying the plane? No, it wasn't. Well, for us as managers, the challenge for us today is that we're so busy changing light bulbs, and they're important light bulbs. They're things that, that we, we have to do, we have to get them done. But the problem is we get so busy with, with all the light bulbs that we're changing that we forget to fly our plane, and which for us is helping our people be as successful as we need them to be. And so that's what nine minutes on Monday is all about. Nine minutes on Monday is like a safety system. As if somebody was able to come into the cockpit, grab the, co the pilot's hair and lift it up and say, look at your gauges and make sure you're flying the plane. Well, that's kind of what nine minutes on Monday is, except for managers. And it's based on a very simple ritual. And that is that every Monday morning, when you come into your office, before you check your email, before you, before you get your to-do list out, before you focus on all your strategic objectives, you sit down, maybe get your coffee first, but other than that, you sit down and you ask yourself nine questions that all have to do with staff engagement and productivity. The answers to which will guide you that week and give you some simple actionable goals that will help keep your people moving. What you're going to hear today is that I'm going to try and convince you that it's the simple things, it's the little things that make the difference over the long haul. It's the little things. And it's based on these nine needs, and if you don't have your handout yet, it'll be coming around soon, but basically these nine needs are like switches. And every time you meet one of them in an employee, it's like it, you switch this, this switch on for a little bit with their own motivation. 
Problem is you gotta, you gotta keep doing it constantly over and over and over again. And we're gonna walk through these nine minutes, these nine needs this morning, and or this afternoon rather, and the first one, the first three, have to do with needs of the individual employee, okay? So does this sound like time well spent here this afternoon? Okay.